Uh, thanks for being here. It's early. I know bass players love drinking, so at 10 a.m. the talk is like a pretty early thing. And um, I am so thrilled to have this three-string bass, which I just uh, got this morning, moments ago. So I'm sure you'll all be um, forgiving for whatever intonation slips there may be. Um, I have a three-string bass in New York City where I live. Uh, but it belongs to Juilliard. I'm really the only one who uses it, but they took it to Japan last week and um, <laughs> with my Dragonetti bow. So um, I thought for sure there was going to be uh, no instrument and I was just going to have to give a talk. And I'm so excited that I can actually demonstrate some of these things on the three street bass. Um, I'm also thrilled that there are so many Dragonetti enthusiasts out there because uh, Dragonetti has been wrongfully pushed to history's back burner. Uh, he's a pretty important guy. Some people will tell you that Beethoven would never have written the bass parts that he did without Dragonetti. Some people will tell you that Odyssey he couldn't have existed without Dragonetti. We'll talk about some of those things today. But first, let's meet this bass, which Arnold Gregorian so generously this morning said to me, yes, you may use this bass in your presentation. So. string bass. A little more clearance between the strings. Um, tuned in fourths, GDA. We'll talk more about tuning in a little bit and how Dragonetti liked to tune his basses. But um, maybe we start with a little bit of music from the man of the hour himself. Um, here is the waltz. <laughs> Bass and you care to do it in a historically informed way, um, 
this would be the appropriate thing to do. So, uh, um, uh, just a few words about myself before we get into Dragon Eddy. Um, I was a member of the San Antonio Symphony for about six years and um, started feeling a little stifled. I, I'm a composer and um, I was fascinated with early music. I love new music and we weren't doing any of that stuff down there. Orchestra jobs are great, but um, it felt like it was time for something new and Juilliard created this historical performance program which is funded by one single multi-billionaire and is therefore free which is the only way I could do it. So I jumped on that, I prepared like it was the Berlin Philharmonic and um, uh, went there, studied with Rob Nairn who really turned me on to a lot of things and I'm happy to have at least the beginning of an early music career in swing. Um, I just finished that and I don't know if any of you have heard of Ensemble ACJW. It's a modern instrument ensemble in residence at Carnegie. It's a two-year fellowship. It's what I'm doing now. It's a good way just to sort of uh, meet a lot of people in the city. And um, uh, for example, I just played Bertafio. Yesterday I was playing Fernie Ho in Buffalo, which is like the opposite end of the spectrum. Nested tuplets, 15 in the space of 17, all this stuff. So it's kind of nice to uh, simplify a little bit. But I uh, love Dragonetti, and I love what he did for the bass, and I love his music. I've always had a soft spot for really circusy music. And Dragonetti definitely fulfills that role. Is it serious music? I don't know. Um, does everything have to be so serious all the time? Maybe not. I do think it's a, uh, an important part of history and a great addition to any recital. And he really has a lot of music. Um, it's worth exploring. Um, also, it's, it's always worth kind of going back to the beginning um, I'm sure I'll have a Bodicini phase someday, too. Bodicini was also a strong advocate of the three-string bass, although he used silk strings on his instrument. We'll talk a little bit more about equipment. Um, I gave uh, this um, something like this talk at Boston Conservatory and asked the question, who here can tell me something about Dragonetti? And I was stunned that there were no hands. I mean, maybe people were being shy, but you would think they would say something. I'm nervous to ask a room full of incredible bass players, what do you know about Dragon Eddy? Because you might give my whole presentation to me um, right now. But uh, does anybody have any interesting um, things they know about Dragon Eddy they'd like to share? He had a dog named Carlo he wrote five pieces for when the dog died. When Carlo went to all of his concerts. Carlo is an important part of Dragon Eddy's life. That's true. <laughs> was there on occasion you would use his thumb around the back of the neck to play him? He had some really interesting left hand technique and right hand technique, which we'll also talk a little bit about. He traveled with life size uh, figures that he seated on the front row. Right. This is. He uh, took with him uh, for social occasions. This is, Apparently, he never left her. This is one reason why Dragonetti gets this reputation for eccentricity. <laughs> <laughs> um, we can talk a little bit more about that. What happened was, he, as he was getting older, a lot of people thought he was done, and they and they were trying to move him out, and he got wind of it, and he knew the right people in the newspapers, yeah, and it backfired, and he became bigger than ever. That that's right. He fought back, and this I wasn't going to talk about, so I'm glad you brought it up. Dragonetti was a fighter, and maybe we, now is a good time to talk a little bit about the man and his character. Um, he was a tall man. He was a handsome man. He was um. He could have been a ladies' man, and maybe was in his youth. Um, he did have this uh, doll collection. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he also referred to his, um, his base as his wife throughout his life. But he was, uh, he was Venetian, he was an Italian, but of course he spent his career in England. Now, um, this is something I just learned, and I don't really have a source for it. But I just learned it a couple days ago, and uh, it was kind of interesting. The, uh, apparently, the, the, this Polish bass player who was living in England just before Dragonetti got there um, died from an autoerotic asphyxiation. Oh and so there was suddenly this vacuum for double bass virtuosi in uh, London. And uh, so it was the perfect time for Dragonetti to move there. And of course, he made a huge splash. Um, and then he met Beethoven and may or may not have influenced the way he wrote. I mean, so it's just an interesting thing that 
we might not have the recits in Beethoven 9 if it weren't for this bizarre practice that killed this other bass player. Um, <laughs> 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 but uh, Dragonetti's father was a bass player and a guitar player, and um, not a particularly good one. His friends would come over and he would try to accompany him on the guitar, and there's a story about him at a very young age saying, Dad, please let me take the guitar. And he realized the chords in a much more um, beautiful and elegant way. Um, he took some violin lessons from the local shoemaker, picked that up really quickly. But the bass is what he really sank his teeth into. And he got this um, solo three-string bass from the uh, church in his town, and it's something he kept his entire life. People offered him huge sums for it. And the church tried to keep it, and he said, no, why on earth would you take this instrument from me? I'm the only one who deserves to play it. And they believed him, uh, which is great. And one of these early stories of him at the church is that uh, the organist said, you can't uh, beat me on your bass. On, um, like, uh, the organ is loud. Like, you play really loud, but the organ is much louder. And so you think there's going to be a showdown, but there's not. Dragonetti just gets the thickest string he can, and in the middle of the night, takes it into the hallway where all the nuns are sleeping, and just <laughs> and it makes this thunderstorm sound. And everybody literally ran out of their rooms screaming. Um, so, I mean, that's even better than a showdown between a bass and an organ. Right? I think so. Um, so he was a... Um, he never really mastered English. Let me see. I have a great uh, transcription of him trying to talk. They said, like, um, oh, you know, he would start talking in, uh, in Italian, maybe say a few words in uh, German, go through French. Um, here we go. Uh, this is an address he gave to the Melodist Society. Uh, gentlemen, we sorry no ladies, very fine the English done, bravo, bravo. Ma, I thank you ten thousand times. I drink all the healths. I no speak fine, mace. My wife, de contrabasso, he take all the speak. And she speak got shaved the queen besser all's nothing. I make all you de compliment her and der duke mille grazie. And I saw propose to Lord Salter sell to three charms tree. She, my friend, and hop it come presto from their chin pieno di denaro. E viva der Lord Salter. <laughs> all right, Drake. <Jake. laughs> that makes sense. Um, and, and when he met Napoleon, he talked to him this way, and Napoleon said, please play your giant violin, because I cannot understand it. <laughs> um, okay, so some other, uh, some other great quirks. You mentioned the dog. That's true. The dog was a um, standard part of his set up in the opera at his feet. Uh, only how sometimes, but uh, he was dragging it. He could do what he wanted. Um, he loved snuff. He collected snuff boxes. Beethoven gave him a snuff box, and he generally carried a giant one and took a lot of snuff throughout the day. Um, he and his buddy, Robert Lindley, who's his uh, stand partner. You guys all know Lindley, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Cellist. Yeah, he was the principal cellist of the, um, of the opera, and, I mean the big cello player in London, and they worked together a lot, and it was uh, for them that Rossini wrote his uh, famous duo. Um, and I mean, they were like, like John and Paul, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it, they would enter together um, all the time, and uh, and in the orchestra, they were set up up front, uh, um, like where we would put the concertmaster today, right next to the conductor. They shared a stand. They accompanied the secco recitatives rather than a uh, keyboard instrument. Uh, Lindley realizing the chords and Dragonetti playing. And boy, I wish I had the wherewithal to have arranged to have a a cellist who's versed in realizing chords and a soprano to try out some secco recitatives because it sounds awesome. And it's just so wild that this is a matter of 50 years um, from Mozart's life, and this was the performance practice. Was it what Mozart intended? Maybe, maybe not. But it was what they were doing at this time. And that's crazy. And that when they stopped doing it, the newspaper articles say, why did you stop this wonderful thing? Like the piano forte, simply can't do it. Um, while we're talking about his quirks and his eccentricities, there's a, this is a great book. 
Um, Fiona Palmer's yeah. Dragon Eddie in England. And, That's the one. Um, it's really expensive. Um, I, I stole this from Julia. I'm going to give it back. But, um, I just ran out of the library with it under my arm. The alarm didn't even go off. Um, I'll give you a story from that book. Do you know he was the highest paid uh, member of the band? Yes. Yeah. Let me uh, get to that in a couple minutes. Okay. Here we go. These are some uh, contemporary accounts of his doll collection, which is pretty interesting. Um, here we go. Here's a short one. Personally, he was very eccentric. He had a large collection of dolls dressed in various national costumes, which he used to take about with him. One, a black doll, he called his wife. His dog, Carlo, always accompanied him to the orchestra. Okay. That's, um, that's not uh, so terrible. How about this? In his salon in Leicester Square, he has collected a large number of various kinds of dolls. Amongst them is a negress. When visitors are announced, he politely receives them and says that this or that young lady will make room for them. He also asks his intimate acquaintances whether his favorite dolls look better or worse since their last visit and similar absurdities. He is a terrible snuff ticket. <laughs> um, uh, you know, it goes on. He, um, he dances, like when he knows somebody is watching him through a window, he'll take his dolls and dance with them. And, I mean, sort of weird for the sake of weird, right? But he did travel with them all the time, and if this was a real historically informed Dragonetti performance, we would have a few of them scattered throughout the audience. Because <laughs> how could he play with that as, with his, his seraglio? He, swear to God he calls it his seraglio. That's, that's just great. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, one, um, since you mentioned it, uh, he was an extremely good businessman and was the highest paid musician, kind of in London period, excepting singers. But in the orchestra, he was paid more than the concertmaster, I mean, always more than the concertmaster, sometimes more than the conductor. And um, here's a, uh, an interesting question. Are you all familiar with his performance? for the premiere of Data of a Nine? Yeah, that's a great story. Right. So. Turns out, uh, he didn't play the premiere of Data of a Nine. He priced himself <laughs> out of it. Uh, he's, he asked for too much money. Can you imagine being a bass player, being asked to lead the recits for the very first time, and saying, sure, you know, 100 grand, I'll do it, and not a penny less. They're like, well, sorry, we only have 50 grand or whatever. Like, OK, that's fine. He's a buddy, like, I'll play it someday. Um, so, so, yeah, maybe Beethoven did write uh, uh, these bass parts uh, with Dragonetti in mind. Maybe the recits were supposed to be one bass, and Dragonetti played really, really loudly. I mean, that was the thing. He could play really fast and really loud. Yes, he could play delicate, too, but when the orchestra was swaying, it only took one Dragonetti to get them back on course. I mean, he really <laughs> drove the orchestra. So, um, it's possible that if Dragonetti had played that premiere, the recits would have been marked solo. And imagine what this would be like for us human bass players who can't play at 6,000 decibels. I mean, it would seem to be an absurdity to have an entire section of cellos and one bass playing. So maybe we should be glad that he didn't play it, because otherwise we would have this huge balance problem to solve every time. Um, but I just played Beethoven 9 last week, and I did notice that it's really hard right at the end, and it seems like something Dragonetti would have just eaten up. The That's classic Dragonetti writing. So, did Beethoven write his bass parts for Dragonetti? Maybe he had them in mind, but I do think it's an overstatement to say that um, uh, he was thinking of Dragonetti all the time. I mean. Beethoven is also the man who said, you think I think about your fiddle when your mu my muses are talking to me. So we can't give Dragonetti too much credit, but it is cool that he was on Beethoven's radar. Um, okay, that's an awful lot of talking. I'm thinking maybe I'll do a little bit more playing, some Dragonetti. Um, this will be from the third concerto. I'll just play the exposition. I think it works fine as a solo piece. We don't need piano. You can imagine it's just playing the harmonies. Um, <laughs>
was the orchestral tutti that I was just playing to link the two things. But there is a firm low A boundary in most of Dragonetti's music. In all of the waltzes, try taking your low string off and playing through some Dragonetti. You will be surprised that you don't miss it. There's never a time where you're going for it and it's not there and it's a problem. Um, this is true in a lot of Botticini's music too. Take a look. A lot of it has this firm low A boundary. Now if you find a piece by Dragonetti with a low G boundary, it's possible that he was simply screwing it um, Something he liked to do. I mean, we bass players still, I know I do tons of scordatura, particularly in uh, Baroque work. There's a million ways to tune a bass. Um, but uh, somebody asked him once, uh, which is better, the four-string bass or the three-string bass? He said, well, it's nice to have those low notes when you're playing in an orchestra, but um, I would give my preference to the three-string bass every time because of its sound. It's just brighter, it's louder, it's more articulate. And um, if you want, by the way, to turn your bass into a three-string bass, take it to a bass shop or do it yourself. Just carve a notch here, and here, it's the poor man's three-string bass, and then you have, it takes five minutes to switch from a four to a three. Try it for yourself. See how loud and articulate it is. There's 80 pounds less pressure when you take that heavy low string off. Um, it's, it's totally worth trying, and in particular, if you're giving a recital and thinking about playing some Dragonetti, the audience likes to see it, and um, Dragonetti smiles from heaven every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, are we sure he had three-string basses? Yes, there's a daguerreotype with him, of course, a famous one where you can see it's a three-string bass. Um, in, uh, in his will, I think he had five or six basses, like Namadi, a couple of solos. Um, they were mostly three-string basses, but he was an explorer. He was curious. He experimented with four-string basses. His God Save the Queen variations does not have this low A boundary. He was obviously playing it on a four-string bass. He even tried a five-string bass. We also have receipts from the strings that he ordered from Venice, his uh, string supplier, and um, he had them made specifically for each bass. So we can see from the orders that he ordered three strings for this bass, four strings for this bass, 
sometimes a fifth string made it into the mix. Um, but he was really, um, you know, exacting and demanding on uh, his string maker. It, it had to be the exact right dimension because it had to fit exactly at the nut in the bridge. And it had to be the exact right length, and he would send it back if it was wrong. We have records of all of these things. Um, Dragonetti's bow grip. I, I wish I had my Dragonetti bow, although the real Dragonetti bow grip is several sticks over this, uh, several fingers over the stick, and one finger through. And it really wasn't until Bottasini that we start having more overhand players as a standard thing. Um, but uh, yeah, let's talk about his two hands briefly, okay? Um, one of Dragonetti's chief sources of virtuosity was in his right hand technique. And in the third movement of this concerto I was just playing, there's a passage, um, I can't remember exactly, but it's something like... Great tune, Dragonetti, right? And, um, something we can all go home humming. Um, but to see Dragonetti play this would have been something completely different because his improvisation wasn't so much with notes or ornaments, it was with his right hand. So um, let's just shout out some different ways I could articulate uh, those triplets that I was just playing. I'll get the ball started. Two slurred, one short. What else could I do? One short, two slurred. One short, two slurred. Another great option. What else could I do? Come on, guys. Do it down or two ups? Down and two ups, okay. I like it. All slurred, that's also good. All up. All up, okay. So let's see if this sounds, I gotta try. Like, um, let's see if this sounds more interesting if I do some of that, okay? Um, His, uh, his Corelli realizations, you see it. Uh, and um, it's so, if you are playing a piece by Dragonetti and you do come to something that looks like kind of a boring page, keep that in mind. Um, and if you look at you, the, the manuscript for the waltzes, is in facsimile, you can find it. Um, he sometimes marks slurs, but sometimes there's a whole waltz without a single marking. Does that mean every note is separate? Absolutely not. Uh, um, don't, um, and don't trust anything any editor tells you ever about uh, the Dragonetti waltzes. Look at the manuscript and, um, uh, and make your own decisions. Get yourself into the head of Dragonetti. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's, uh, that's his right hand. Let's talk about his left hand for a second. Uh, to, if we're going to play a chromatic scale, today's bass player is going to go like this. Right? One, two, four, probably. That's the way most of us are cut. Some of us use our third finger. Um, typical uh, bass playing left hand technique in England at this time, and yes, there are methods you can see that I'm not lying. One four, one four, no matter what, half step, whole step, and they would write a little M for a half step or a big M for a whole step. So a chromatic scale. Three. This is uh, the state of bass playing in England, um, and you can imagine a whole section of bass players, you know. Um, <laughs> um, they, they were just not using two and three. So was Dragonetti's revolution introducing two and three? Yes, but there is a contemporary account of his um, of his fingerings. I swear to God, it says he would play this A flat with his thumb, right flat, both thumb, one, two, three, four, thumb again. Was he playing this way all the time? Probably not. I mean, whatever was comfortable. But was he using his thumb down here? Yes, he was. That's crazy. I mean, that boggled my mind when I saw it. Who would ever play an A flat with their uh, thumb? Unless this, uh, this source is uh, somehow garbled. But um, he writes specifically, this is how Dragonetti fingered this chromatic scale. That's um, pretty interesting. Um, so the tuning of these three of, the, of all basses was different by country, sort of the way it is still now. 
you know, in Germany they use five string basses with a low B. In France, they, if you have a five string bass, there's a good chance it's tuned to a C. It's the same deal back then. Um, tuning in fourths and fifths both existed. Um, Dragonetti brought this three string fourth tuning to England and uh, it was pretty much exclusively the way people tuned. In Germany they had four string basses that were tuned to an E or an F. And people said, that's great, but, you know, sometimes it gives some profundity to the orchestra, but honestly, those notes are unnecessary because nobody can hear them anywhere. Today we disagree, maybe our ears are better than theirs were. Um, and in France they used a three-string bass, but they tuned it in fifths, G, D, A. Um, which is, again, something Dragonetti explored, but you can always tell what tuning he had in mind just from the writing from the writing and the harmonics, and from the boundaries. If he has his top string tuned to an A, there aren't going to be tons of G major arpeggios. Why would you do that? He wasn't trying to make his life any harder than it needed to be. Um, so, one more thing to talk about, and then I'll play another waltz. Um, and this is... Uh, what do you do when you're playing Beethoven 5 and you've got a three-string bass? could do that, but um, Dragonetti's answer, and again, this is documented, was just to pop the whole thing up in octave. Imagine you did that in orchestra today, and you just played it up, but conductors loved it. It was so loud, and it's in, now in the same octave as the cellos, and maybe the one guy with the four-string bass plays it in the octave that it's written, but this is uh, um, standard practice for Dragonetti. Don't take awkward single notes up an octave, pop the whole passage up an octave. And he could do it, and so he was playing in cello range for a lot of these really famous excerpts that we think of as, you know, immovable, something we could never change. Um, things were a little more fluid back then. I don't know what Beethoven would have said about it, but it is what he did. And um, at the exact same time we have uh, people writing for example, that fourth string stuff in uh, the sixth symphony. Well, don't play all those notes. You play this. This is what the bass player does. Again, you'll be laughed off the stage if you try to do that in an orchestra today. But simplifying bass parts was really standard practice until, I don't know. What do you think? 1900? Like, <laughs> at, at least. Yeah. Um, like, uh, you just take out notes you don't want to play. Um, and uh, I, I suspect this may have been the case for things like the Hofner Symphony. Although, if you've ever played the Hofner Symphony on a Viennese bass, you, you'll find that it actually lies under the fingers very well, and um, is not quite the finger buster that we think of it today. So anyway, just an interesting uh, thing to think about. That one has less practical application for your life in the orchestra. Um, but it does show that um, that Dragonetti did whatever the hell he wanted all the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and got good reviews for it. Yeah, great reviews. From the page of five. Yeah. People loved Dragonetti. When he walked on stage, they stood up and cheered. Seriously. He was a big shot. Uh, Oh, when, uh, if anyone has a chance to pop by Northwestern, um, north of Chicago anytime soon, if you go to the music library, they actually have a lot of the uh, documents and letters and, and things that are used as a primary source in that book if you want to have a fan moment of going, I'm holding something right there. Right. Um, if, you, if you're nice to the, the head librarian, they'll pull it out. Right, cool. And for that matter, uh, most of Dragon Daddy's manuscripts are at the British Museum. And if you go, and I know John Feeney does this all the time. You're an important. Yeah. Right, you probably can't just, I mean, if you're really charming and you know how librarians work, it might be. <laughs> uh, but that's where most of his manuscripts are. Um, but
but yeah, getting back to what Paul said a second ago, like um, he got great reviews and people just went nuts for him. Um, they, but an interesting thing that we don't really think about much with Dragonetti and Bottasini is they both only wrote solo music for a very short part of their lives. Dragonetti was really in vogue as a soloist for about three to five years, like really writing a lot of concertos, selling out concert halls, people begging him to play concerts. Um, after that, he was really, um, he would play solos as part of sh shows, but um, it wasn't the uh, Dragonetti love fest that it used to be. Barasini similarly wrote all of his music at the age, uh, for solo bass at the age that we associate with like a master's degree, and then wrote opera for the rest of his life. And he would play his pieces, you know, between acts of operas, um, but they weren't new pieces, they were essentially student pieces. It's just an interesting parallel between the two. Um, okay, this is my favorite Dragonetti Waltz, um, number six, A major. <laughs> Bases now, do you know? Um, they're kind of a uh, lot of different places, right? And, what, um, and I think 
In Venice at the San San Marco That's the famous sala, right? Isn't the giant one is Victoria and Albert? The one that hangs. Right. There's another place to go see it. But yeah, largely in Italy and and in England. Although somebody told me once, or just a few days ago, I mentioned I was talking about Dragnetti and said something like, "Oh, I saw his base at CIM." So. Maybe it was touring the way like Elvis's piano went touring. <laughs> <laughs> There's one in the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Oh, yeah? Like that guy's fine. What? Yeah. Yeah. And there, there's a person at the convention who has a former Dragon Any Base. Yeah, Kurt Morocchi has one. Oh, yeah. Kurt has one and I have one. I have yeah. an own one. Yeah. I I and written it. inside the top it said, uh, watch the property of Signore uh, Dragonetti from, and I can't remember the dates, but it was an 11 year period towards the end of his life. Wow. It's, 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 it's in David Gage's shop. Yeah. It's, uh, Tim's, Tim's Moussard is also ascribed on the, on the, on the scroll. Um, yeah. And it, it's an apartment, you know. Right. It's four residents available. Right. <laughs> and, and you look at the, how the setup was before when the original next set was and all of that. We couldn't tell because when Tim got it, even it had been in Philadelphia a long time. Um, the knot had been changed, and of course it was set up for, for, for Forrester. Right. But it was still easy to see some of the work and how it had been done. Yeah. And it's it's mind blowing. Right. Absolutely. Mind -blowing. So I guess there's great many bases out there. Just a, just another goofy uh, personal anecdote of his from these letters is that he would often send letters back to Venice because he'd send money to his sister to support her, mm -hmm. and he would often uh, complain and scold her for wasting all the money on gambling and boys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's a little bit of insight into his yeah. personal life. Yeah, fun ran deep in In Botticini's method, you can read that he says mostly when, when he's writing with a G glyph. Is meaning harmonics, and I think I've read something about it in, uh, about Dragonetti's uh, music in Jonas Palmer's book. Uh, Dra Dragonetti's uh, use of G clef is um, the same as G clef in Viennese bass, mm -hmm. and it's also the same as old notation for the cello. It's written an octave higher, so uh, it sounds two octaves lower than it's written. This is in manuscript. If you get an addition, they're going to correct that. Um, because they think we can't figure it out. But, I mean, we know this because it, we'll see a scale that's like... <laughs> and, uh, and it's obviously using that old notation where any time you put a bass instrument in treble clef, you write it up an octave to say, hey, this is really high, pay attention. <laughs> uh, but most, um, if you've looked at Schwerger's manuscripts, um, they're actually really hard to read because they're all way above the treble clef, and um, it's it's kind of impractical. But there, I, I think uh, Rod Nair once proposed a theory to me that this was also partly to make the music look harder to non-bass players. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting uh, <laughs> Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Anybody else? There's, there's a great story that he got a gig in another town, and uh, <clears throat> uh, he thought it was for bass, and it was for viola. So he just played the viola part for the session. Oh, right. Yeah, and you guys probably know the Viotti story too, right? This is a good one to close with. Um, he uh, contacted Viotti. He was like, I, I'm a fan of your work. I like your music. Let's play some violin duets. And Viotti came expecting a violinist. And uh, um, it was, uh, he had a bass, and Viotti laughed like, are you joking? Well, you can play second violin. And like uh, halfway through the first duet, he was like, you know what? You play first violin. This is totally amazing. <laughs> the other story that's a little apocryphal, um, but it's recorded by many people, so we sort of have to believe it's true. And this one you probably all know because it's so famous. Is this meeting with Beethoven and playing Beethoven cello sonata for him. And uh, Beethoven, after a particularly ferocious passage, Jumping up and giving him a big hug, you know, and uh, that's just, I think it's something we can feel proud of as bass players, that Beethoven could be so moved by a bass player that he would actually embrace him. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you so much for being here.